The scriptures have a lot to say about riches and to rich people. God has a word for us because we happen to be very, very rich, even if we don't see it. So open with us to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Consider the scriptures with us. And we're going to be in the book of 1 Timothy, which is right near the end of your Bible. Open to the very last book, Revelation, and turn to the left. You'll find 1 and 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6 is where we're at. As you're turning there, real simple question. So is it Yanni or is it Laurel? Oh, see, there's some people then browsing the internet. You know about that. All right. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Hey, as you turn in there also, today is a big day for the church, not just our church, but the church as a whole, because this is the celebration of the Feast of Pentecost today, and that's actually the birthday of the church. So happy birthday, church. The church is like 1,988 years old, if you go by the counting. There. So happy birthday. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. There, Paul says, command those who are rich in the present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. Father, we thank you. I thank you as we're standing here for your grace. The only reason that we're standing here this morning is because of your grace, and you have graciously poured out upon us in such awesome ways. Uh, First, Lord, your common grace, which is given to all of us. Lord, the fact that we have anything that we have, the blessings that so many of us enjoy are because of your grace. But more than that, Lord, I hope that all of us standing here today have experienced your saving grace. We thank you that it is in your name. We just sang about the greatness of your name. And we thank you that it is in your name that we have saving grace. Lord, that you have dealt with our sin and our failures. You continue to deal with our sin and failures every day. We praise you for that. We pray that as we consider the scriptures before us today, that you would continue the work of sanctifying by your grace. Lord, make us more like you, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all those that agreed said, amen. Amen. You can be seated. In the Gospels, there is a story recorded. It's actually recorded in three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it's a pretty well-known story. In fact, even a lot of people who don't really spend much time reading through the Scriptures know about this story. There was a young man who came to Jesus. In fact, the Scriptures reveal he came running to Jesus, and he kneels before him with an important question. And just the posture of this individual makes it clear that this was an important question to him. And in Mark's Gospel... Chapter 10, you can turn there if you'd like. A story is recorded there. It tells us a little bit about this whole event, that as Jesus was going out on the road, Mark 10, 17, one came running to him, knelt before him, and asked, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? As you go through Matthew's account and Luke's account, and you put these together with Mark's account of this story, you begin to determine a few things about this man who came to Jesus. He was young. He was rich, and he was a ruler. And it's highly likely that this young man had the position and the possessions that he did by inheritance. Just figuring the time that this took place, the location that this took place, it's highly unlikely that he was rich and he was a ruler at the young age that he was by his own abilities or efforts, very likely that he had inherited his position and his possessions. And so his question to Jesus is intriguing. Good teacher, what good thing shall I do to inherit eternal life? All the things he had was probably by inheritance, except there was something that this good teacher was talking about that he did not have. It did not come to him in the will. And so he sees his life, he's got position, he's got possessions, he's got power, he's got everything that you might want in a worldly sense, but this good teacher was talking about something that he wanted that he didn't have. So he effectively bows before him 
An interesting position for a rich young ruler. Bows before him and says, what do I got to do to get into your will? I want what you got. And so Jesus' answer is interesting because he begins by saying, why do you call me good? You said good teacher. Why do you call me good? For no one is teacher or is good but God. And then he goes on to answer and he says to him, well, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And then this young man, he makes an audacious claim. He says, all of these things I have kept since my youth. And Jesus doesn't come against him in that audacious claim. He simply says to him, looking at him, I love this. Mark's gospel says, looking at him, he loved him. I think Jesus in his mind just was kind of, I love this guy. <laughs> what do I got to do to get what you got? Everything you're talking about, I've done that. What more do I got to do? And Jesus looking at him, he loved him and he said, one thing you lack, go. Sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come. Take up your cross and follow me. But he was sad. At the word of Jesus, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And then the application, the teaching of Jesus to his disciples after this rich young ruler went his way, Jesus says to this guy, come follow me. And then he turns to his disciples who had left everything to come follow him. And Jesus says this, some striking words for him. Him. It's recorded in verse 23. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And his disciples, they were astonished at this because in their worldview in that day, they equated riches with the blessing of God. If you have wealth, if you have riches, then you have the blessing of God. And if you have the blessing of God, then of course you're going to be in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven. You know, that hasn't changed so much. There's a lot of people still today who look at Worldly wealth or riches and figure, well, they're just blessed. Hashtag blessed. And so they figured, well, of course this guy's going to heaven. Of course he's going to get into the kingdom of God. He's rich. But Jesus says how hard it is for those who are rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the reason that I went to Mark's gospel instead of Matthew's account or Luke's account of this event is because in Mark's gospel, Jesus adds a little line. There's a little bit more to the story after he makes this statement it's hard for those who are rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. He says this after his disciples were astonished. It's recorded at the end of verse 24 in chapter 10 of Mark. He says, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Not because he has riches, but because of the great temptation to trust in those riches. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? And Jesus, he looked at them and said, with men, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. It was a good word, a good thing to remember. So this man came to Jesus, and he was looking to lay hold of eternal life. In the passage that we're in here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, we, we see that idea, that concept, laying hold of eternal life, come up twice. We considered it together last week, if you were here with us, in the previous section of 1 Timothy chapter 6. There, Paul made the exhortation to Timothy, the one who this letter was written to, and he says, Timothy, you need to lay hold of eternal life. And we considered together, if you were here last week, you heard it. If not, you can get it on our website. But we considered together how that does not mean that you need to earn eternal life or try to strive to get eternal life, but you to lay hold of it. It's something that God gives to us as we put our trust and our confidence in him for salvation. It's promised to us in eternity, but to experience it now is the desire that Jesus has for his disciples. That's why Jesus in the Gospel of John would say, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Not just something that we're kind of in this weird suspended animation as Christians just waiting for the day that Jesus returns or we die and then finally we will experience eternal life. He says, no, now you can lay hold of eternal life. You can experience the peace and the joy and the blessing of eternal life now. And so Paul exhorted Timothy that he would lay hold of that. And now here in this passage, Paul says to Timothy, I want you to command those who are rich in this present time, in this present age, these certain things that we're going to consider together so that they also would lay hold of eternal life. Is there anything that you'd rather securely lay hold of than eternal life? And yet, as I think about that 
question. You know, I, I, that's in my heart. You know, it's been called one of the first desires of the soul of humanity is to live on and on. We see billions of dollars of investment today by venture capitalists going into life extension programs. People want to live and to continue to live on and on. So there's a deep desire in my own heart for eternal life. And the Bible talks about laying hold of that eternal life. But I would have to confess that in many ways, that is not the chief goal. Or at least as you look at my life on a daily basis, it does not appear to be the chief end or passion of my life to lay hold of eternal life. But the scriptures call us to that. The reason I say that is because I see in my own heart, and maybe you see it in yours as well, that I have and can have a very divided heart. I want what God promises in the scripture of his blessing and his presence, but there's so many other things in this world that seem to entice my desire. I feel oftentimes that I am like a desire factory. I just churn out desire all day long. Can anyone? Yes, you with me? Okay, good. It's not just me. If you didn't raise your hand, you're a liar. But um, so (laughs) it's just there. And I am enticed by things constantly. And yet I read passages like we've been looking through here in 1 Timothy where it says that godliness with contentment is great gain. And I know that theologically. We we saw here in this passage that the desire for worldly riches is a temptation and a snare. It's It's like a tempting piece of meat over a trap for a lion or a bear. The desire for riches. And I see that in the world. I I see it theologically in the scriptures. I know it. The love of money and greediness is dangerous. The scriptures make very, very clear. And yet still I find in my own heart that there is this enticement towards envy and covetousness of things. I was reminded of this this last week. I got a text message late in the day on Wednesday from a friend who lives up in another state. And he said, hey, do you have a few minutes to talk? I I need some counsel. I need some godly wisdom. And I was thinking, why did you reach out to me? So uh, I was a good friend. And I said, you know, I'm putting my kids to bed. Can I, I texted back to him, can I call you in about 40 minutes? He said, yeah, no problem. So I call him. I said, hey, what's going on? He said, well, out of the blue, just a couple hours ago, I got an unsolicited job offer for a seven-figure salary. And I was like, really? And what do you need my help with? In my mind, I'm thinking, when someone says that, you go, is it illegal? Is it immoral? No, yes, I take it. <laughs> Let's do it. He's saying, I'm really struggling. I, don't, I need to know. I need God's heart. I want wisdom in this whole thing of taking that. And, and after I got off the phone with him, praying with him, talking with him, I find myself just thinking, wow, seven figures. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> right? I mean, that's why people play the lottery, you know, that kind of thing right there. And, and I find in myself is that, that pull. And I, I realize I, it is highly unlikely that I will ever see a seven-figure income. And, and most of you, same thing, would almost never have that as a possible temptation. But it reminded me of the reality that there is envy and there is the love of earthly wealth in my fallen heart. Now, here's the problem. Though I will likely never see a seven-figure income, and probably you will not either. The problem is, is that I I already have great wealth, significant riches, that already can be a snare, that can have a devastating grip upon me. I, I have this striking proclivity in my own heart towards envy and towards wanting all these things, but at the same time, I can be completely blind to the fact that I have so much and oftentimes I'm ungrateful for the things that I have. And then I come to a passage like this that speaks to that very danger zone that says, command those that are rich in the present age. And we we have to stop there because we have to deal with a fallacy that I think that a lot of us deal with. And that is that when we come to a passage like this, we read that, command those who are rich in the present age, we go, well, this isn't for me. That's for the other guy. So not only do we fall into the trap of thinking, this doesn't apply to me, I just skip over this, move on. But not, we, we then take this passage and we start to judge other people by it. We have this problem with judging other people. We're damn good at judging other people. I know because right now you're thinking, he should not have said that. <laughs> I gotcha. It's there. 
And so we read this passage and we go, well, it's not for me. And we start to judge other wicked, rich, those one percenters. Not so fast. It's a passage of scripture that even a lot of people who've never read the Bible know because they use it against Christians. And they say, Jesus said, you shall not judge. You ever had someone tell you that? Well, the Bible does say that. Jesus did say that. It's in Matthew's gospel, chapter seven. It says this, judge not that you be not judged. There you go. Jesus said, you shall not judge. Well, he didn't exactly say that. There's more than just that. For with what judgment you judge, it shall be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and you do not regard the two by four in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your own eye and look, the plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye and then you shall see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I took a counseling class, biblical counseling class years ago and it was on this big book called Biblical Self-Confrontation and it was built on this very passage and the whole point was that before you start to give counsel input to other people, make sure you remove the speck or your beam from your own eye before you start to try and remove the speck from others. It's an important value but we're really good at casting judgment upon people. And my flesh is inclined towards comfort. I don't like discomfort. So when I come to passages which are convicting, and I will suggest right now that this passage we're in, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 and on, it's a challenging, convicting passage of Scripture. But when we read it, command those who are rich, we instantly jump out of that and we go, well, the spotlight is no longer on me. It's on those wicked one percenters. And so I don't, need to, I don't need to take regard to this passage. But again, not so fast. We need a little bit of a reality check. And if you want to begin to grow in your walk in faith, then point number one on your outline, use the Bible as a mirror, not a microscope. A mirror to see yourself and not a microscope to examine other people. We're really good at the microscope analogy. But the Apostle James, he used the metaphor of the Bible being like a mirror, and we are able to see ourselves. And he cautioned us against something that I think we all can fall into, that be careful that you not just look into the mirror of God's word and then walk away and forget what you saw. And we can do that. And so we need to examine ourselves with the Scripture. And so we have to examine ourselves with this scripture. So reality check. If you own more clothing than the clothes you're currently wearing right now, you are in the top 25% of wealth holders in the world today. If you drove here today in a vehicle that you own, or maybe you lease it, but it's your vehicle, from a house or even a condo or an apartment, you don't even own, you just rent, and in that house there's running water, you can turn on the sink and water comes out, clean water that you could drink, even though you'd rather spend $6 a gallon on water from the store. Um, if you can get clean water in that way, you're in the top 15% of wealth holders in the world. If you made more than $50,000 last year, you're not just in the top 10%. You're not even just in the top 5%. Do you realize you're not even in just the top 1%? You're in the top 0.31% of wealth holders in the world. So you remember that thing 10 years ago in New York City? A whole bunch of young millennials with $1,000 phones twittering. Occupy Wall Street. Down with the 1%. Oh, the irony of that whole situation. Because that's all of us. That's us. We are that 1%. So when we come to this passage and it says, command those who are rich in the present age, that's us. And so God has something he wants to say to us here in this passage, even though we like to try and shift this and focus it on somebody else. No, this is for us. So what is the command he says? Command, verse 17, command those that are rich in the present age, that number one, they be not haughty. That they not be haughty. Another word for haughty is proud or I like high-minded. High-minded. You say, oh, that's not, not us, right? If you have ever looked at anyone who doesn't seem to have what you have in the same way, and you've had the thought go through your mind, they need to get their act together. If they just work a little harder, they could get ahead in this life. If you've ever had that thought, and I would say we probably all have, 
then, then we have fallen into the snare of being high-minded with our riches. Point number two, the mirror of God's word exposes my concealed pride. And, and what foolishness this pride is. You know, I do think, as I look at my, my wife and I, I do feel like we have worked hard to get to the point where we are in our lives, but certainly no harder than the farmer in East Africa, and probably less so. Certainly no harder than the textile worker in Indonesia who right now is working for 39 cents an hour. You see, I am the recipient of what has been referred to as the lottery of life. So are you. Sometimes it's been called the postcode lottery. What is that? Well, it's like this. One of the greatest investors of all time, one of the most wealthy men of all time, Warren Buffett, he says, anything that I have gained to me in this life is because I was born at the right time in the right place. And there is so much truth to that. And, and it's a pretty humble statement. It's an acknowledgement that I just happened to be born at the right time in the right place. And one of the greatest nations that affords people the opportunity for wealth generation at one of the greatest times, the 20th and 21st century of all time. And this is nothing new, this observation of Warren Buffett, nothing new. 3,000 years ago, one of the wisest men who ever lived, a guy by the name of Solomon, he was really an anthropologist, a sociologist, and he went on this research experiment to assess life, and he came to this conclusion. It's become a verse that I really have found myself turning to quite frequently over the last couple of years. It's in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11, and I love the way the New Living Translation translates it. It says this, I have observed something else in the world. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. The strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry, and the skillful are not necessarily wealthy. And those who are educated do not always lead successful lives. It is all decided by chance and by being in the right place at the right time. Now, there's a danger of falling into a fatalism in that kind of thought process. And that's exactly what Solomon fell into. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you see that it brought him to a place of just saying, well, it's all just vanity. It's all worthless. You might as well just eat and drink and die. So there's a real danger of fatalism, that kind of thinking. But there is a way in which you look at the world and you go, well, there's, there's some truth in that. It's all determined by being in the right place at the right time. And so Paul has a command for us who have been in the right place at the right time. And he says, command those that are rich in the present age that they not be haughty, nor that they trust in uncertain riches, verse 17 says. Point number three on your outline. In the mirror, I see my misplaced trust. And maybe we could call it displaced trust. But what is, at its core, what is misplaced or displaced trust? It's what the Bible calls idolatry. We don't like to think of it like that, but that's exactly what it is. And when I open up the mirror of the scriptures and I allow myself to be examined by the mirror of the scriptures, I see that at the core, I can be an idol of other things. And especially in 21st century America, what more is idolized than money and wealth and riches? That's at the top of the list among some other things that people idolize, but certainly that's very near the top. And so Paul describes here a misplaced trust in riches, but not just riches, in what he calls uncertain riches, riches that are ultimately untrustworthy. It's not worth your trust. And yet we do find ourselves tempted to trust in those things because we think that in those things is found security. We hope for security. But the fact is, when you really start to peel it back, you realize it's about the same kind of security as those little chain locks that people put on their doors. That's got to be about the most laughable security device on the planet. Because my nine-year-old could defeat that in about a second and a half by just putting his hundred pounds into that door. Or you know those scissors they sell at one o'clock in the morning on, like, that can cut through like everything? That, you can just cut through that little chain. Boom. That's security. That's about the same level of security that uncertain riches provide. And we saw that. There's a case study just right before all of us in the last decade and a half in our own nation. Because the, the ramp up to the financial collapse of 2008, the, 
four or five years leading up to that, we saw people putting their security, their trust in their mutual fund, their trust for the future, their hope in the equity of their home. And then just like that, it's gone. And so there's a real uncertainness to those things. So Paul says that we need to be careful that we not fall into this place where we are trusting in uncertain riches. Now, does that mean that we not save? Does that mean that we not invest? No, that's not what it means, but it does mean this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, command those who are rich that they not be haughty, that they not trust in uncertain riches, but that they trust in the living God. It's amazing. He says, do not put your hope and your trust in something that's tangible. We, t- we call these things tangible assets, Right? He says, don't put your trust for security, your hope, in that which is tangible, but put it in that which is unseen, the living God. So there's more danger in trusting in those tangible assets than trusting in the intangible and unseen living God. Because he is him who gives us, as verse 17 says, gives us richly all things to enjoy. Point number four. The truly rich acknowledge God's blessing for all that they enjoy. If all that you enjoy, think about it for a moment, just, I don't like to use the word visualize, but visualize. All that you enjoy, the list is long. I mean, you, you could spend a significant amount of time taking a list of all the things that you enjoy. If all that you enjoy is the product, the result of your ingenuity, of your tenacity, of your determination, then it makes perfect sense that you would be high-minded, haughty. Look what I did. Look what I acquired. If all that you have is the product of your own tenacity, then it would make perfect sense that you would be envious of that which other people have. Look how hard I've worked to get here, and and they have so much more. It makes perfect sense that you would be greedy in your relentless drive to get more. I've got to attain so much more by my own ingenuity and tenacity and determination. It would make perfect sense that you would be miserly and uncharitable in the possession of those things. I'm not giving to anybody. They need to work like I work to get here it would make perfect perfect sense that you'd not be thankful because you did it yourself. But here's something I've observed, and maybe you've seen it too. You cannot be happy and be greedy and be envious and be high-minded. Those things do not go together with joy. That's why there are so many people in this world that have so much and yet have so little happiness. It's a striking thing that our nation, when polled and asked about their level of happiness, Gallup has been running a daily poll for more than 30 years on daily happiness tracking, and it rises and falls with the Dow Jones. That's striking. But if you acknowledge God as the source and the sustainer of all that you possess, the truly rich acknowledge God's blessing for all that they enjoy, if you acknowledge that he's the source, he's the sustainer, then you will enjoy the blessing he has provided. Now, I think it's very important for us to acknowledge that he says that he has richly given us all things to enjoy. There are some Christians who live as if, if I enjoy the things I have, then it's wrong. That's not what the scriptures say. You can enjoy the things that God has blessed you with if you acknowledge he's the one who's blessed you and if you're humble with those things and if you are charitable with those things, there's no problem in enjoying those things. And if you acknowledge that he is the source and the sustainer of all the things that you have, that you possess, that you enjoy, then you, it'll be more likely that you will be humble with those things. It'll be less likely that you will be covetous 
or that you'll be envious, or that you'll be jealous of others. It'll be more likely that you'll be grateful. It'll be less likely that you'll be greedy. It'll be more likely that you'll be loving and charitable with those things that you have and enjoy if you say, these are not mine by my own ingenuity and determination or tenacity, but this is all from God. And especially if you go the further step and recognize all those things that you enjoy, you own none of it. You're simply a steward of what he has put under your care. And so Paul says, command the rich that they not be haughty, high-minded, that they not trust in uncertain riches, but they trust in the living God who has richly given us all things to enjoy. And then he says this, command them that they do good and that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Point number five, enduring blessing is found in giving as you have been given. And so I'm going to invite the ushers to, no, I'm not. (laughs) Enduring blessing is found in giving as you have been given. That rich young ruler who came to Jesus, Jesus said to him, go and sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But the scriptures say of that young man that he went away sorrowful because he had much wealth. And that word had is very important because what he had was keeping him from what Jesus had for him. And what he had in holding so tightly to it was going to keep him from what he could have. And what he had was the only thing that he ultimately would ever have until he was willing to hold it with an open hand. And Jesus gives him this wonderful call, come follow me, the source of all blessing, the source of all joy. And so, I, you know, I think it kind of brings us to what I would call a a slightly altered Peter Parker principle. Who's Peter Parker? Spider-Man, Spider-Man. With great power comes great, what? Responsibility. That's the Peter Parker principle. So slightly altered, with great blessing comes great responsibility. Many people know one of the most famous verses in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But do you know 1 John 3, 16? It says this, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And then verse 17, it's challenging. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? 2 Corinthians chapter 8 says that Jesus Christ, he was rich, and yet he set aside his riches so that he could, he became poor so that he could make us rich. That's the pattern, that is the course that he calls us to. And this church at Ephesus that Paul was ultimately writing to as he's writing to their pastor, Timothy, they were off course And maybe there probably were some pretty wealthy people. It was a very wealthy trade city of that time. And there were some wealthy people there. And maybe they had stumbled into the area of being very high-minded and haughty. And they were trusting in their riches and not trusting in the living God. And so Paul says, there needs to be an exhortation to them. So command them these things, Timothy, so that they would store up for themselves. It says in verse 19, store up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come and that they might lay hold on eternal life. This storing up for the time to come, I think there's two ways that we can read it. One certainly is to store up for eternity, life beyond this life. The Bible makes it very clear. Jesus taught that we, Christians, followers of Jesus, need to have a mindset, a worldview where we understand that this is not all there is and there's another life, a greater life than this. And that's why in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, he would say that we should lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven where they are more secure than they could ever be secure in this life. So he encouraged us to have that mindset. So certainly when Paul says here that we need to stay up or lay up for the time that is to come, he's talking about eternity. But I think he's also talking about a time that is to come in this world, in this life, 
that we need to be storing up for ourselves. For that time, you see, it is the generous person who lives life with an open hand, wherein God can give blessing and they can give that blessing as well. It is the generous person, when they have much, who is generous will, when they have little, because riches are uncertain, that they will be generously blessed by others who will also bless them during that time. And so Jesus would say, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, it will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. I find it so interesting that he says the identical words about judgment. With the same judgment you judge, you will be judged. But with the same way you give, you'll be blessed. Well, here's the the challenge to this. The last two verses, verse 20 and 21 of 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul says, O Timothy... Guard what is committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. It's providential. It's God's inspired truth that this would be the the final word on this because what we see shared from the scriptures as it relates to riches, especially that exhortation that Jesus gave in the gospels about give and it shall be given to you. Do you realize that in the 20th and 21st century, one of the biggest exports of American Christianity has been a gospel called the prosperity gospel? It's a sad reality that this has been put forth as, well, it's falsely been called the knowledge of the scriptures. There are Churches all throughout our nation that are exporting it to other parts of the world, and this has been the biggest export of American Christianity over the last 50 years has been a gospel that says that God reigns in heaven purely for your pleasure and enjoyment in this life. And there's a real danger because the scriptures say things like, give and it shall be given to you. And so we have a challenge because there are those who put forth this knowledge that is falsely called knowledge, falsely called gospel, And they say, see, the scriptures say it. They can point to chapter and verse. The scriptures say it. And yet the heart behind it is wrong. Because we need to take heart to the command that we who are rich not be high-minded or haughty, nor put our trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who has richly blessed us with all things to enjoy. But he's done so because he wants us to be rich in good works. And so may it be that your biggest net worth is your net worth of good works so that people will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And here's the thing. He said, so that you will lay hold on eternal life. And it's very important that he's not saying so that you will earn eternal life because you do not earn your eternal life by your good works. Your earned eternal life was earned by Jesus. But so that you will experience eternal life. Walk as he walked as Jesus walked, as he was one who gave and gave and gave to the uttermost. And that's what he calls us to do too. Amen? Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Father, I thank you for your word. It is challenging, but it's good. All scripture is given by inspiration from you and it is useful for doctrine, it shows what's right and true. And in establishing what is right and true, it shows our error. It rebukes and reproves us, but it also has the ability to correct us and bring us back to righteousness, back on course. And the church at Ephesus 2,000 years ago was off course. And in some ways, our hearts, our minds can be off course. So God, would you cause your word to set us right? And that when we go from this room in just a few minutes, that We wouldn't just immediately be distracted by jelly-filled or chocolate-covered donuts, but that we would be able to think on these things. God, transform us. We thank you for the blessings that you give to us, have given to us. We do richly enjoy those things, but God, help us to see that those things are given to us by you. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. And Lord, there will be a day when I give an account 
for how I've used what you've given to me. So God, would you help me to be rich in good works for your name's sake? For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all those that agreed said, Amen. Amen. Lord, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby they must be saved. And we thank you for the saving grace and power that comes through you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you that on this day, nearly 2,000 years ago, you birthed your church, you started the church, and you gave the gift of your Holy Spirit, and we pray, God, that in the same way that the early disciples received that infilling of your Spirit, pray that you would freshly pour out your Spirit upon us, your church, and that you would empower us by your strength and power, Holy Spirit, to walk in these things and to share the good news of your grace with others. And we pray especially for the event that will be going on tonight with Franklin Graham at Grape Day Park. And we ask, God, that you would pour out your spirit upon Franklin and his team. Lord, fill them to overflowing with your supernatural grace and power. We pray for those that would come to that event tonight. We ask, God, that you would draw people to yourself through the proclamation of the gospel. We thank you that we have the ability in our nation to publicly have an event like that. We pray for your blessing upon it. God, do a work. Pour out your spirit upon your church, we pray. Empower us to be lights to a dark world wherever you take us this week, we pray. And now may the Lord bless and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be